Okay, class, once again, greetings from Warsaw. Um, today, we're going to pick up where we left off last time. Our learning objectives are the following. We left off talking about these SN curves, so it's the stress amplitude versus number of cycles until failure. We're going to uh, pick up with those, talking about how do we deal with sample variability in those. Um, we're then going to talk about crack propagation and actually ask the question, what does it look like in a sample? We'll then try and figure out how to model and predict crack propagation before we turn our attention to something known as creep or time-dependent plastic deformation in material science. Uh, from creep we'll actually be able to uh, predict steady state creep strain rates so we can know what uh, deformation does over time. And the last thing we'll get to is describe accelerated testing using the Larson-Miller parameter. Okay, So let's start right into variability with SN curves. Where we left off last time was we said the following. We said that the stress intensity versus the number cycle for lots of materials it looks like that for materials that have a fatigue limit it might look like that right so the question is this represents the point at which it fails but we know that if you were to test 100 samples not all 100 are going to test at the same stress right they all have some variability so how do we account for variability in these sorts of curves what would you do if you were generating these sort of curves what would you do to help people understand the variability that is inherent in your materials? So go ahead and pause this TAs and lead a discussion here. Okay, hopefully the TAs helped you guys understand that one of the best ways to deal with this is to add multiple curves, right? Let's say you add a curve right here, and that's a low stress. That represents when maybe the first 1% of your samples fails. And then maybe you've got like another curve right here, and at that point, maybe something like 50% of your samples fail. Um, sorry, maybe 25%, excuse me. Maybe that's 25% of your samples. This black line, the average, maybe that's your 50% failure. And out here, by that point, at that stress, maybe 99% of your samples have failed, right? So showing multiple lines where you show what fraction of your samples typically fail is a much better way to encompass more information about sample variability in an S versus N curve, right? Okay, question I have for the TAs to lead now is some materials like polymers, they have a strong dependence on frequency, whereas others do not, meaning this value at which things will fail uh, seems to be strongly dependent on the the rate at which you're testing it for some samples, but not for others. Polymers, it depends on it a lot, so go ahead and discuss what might be the cause. Okay, hopefully that in your discussion it came up that polymers can heat up. Right, and as they heat up, uh, different mechanisms of polymers in disentangling and therefore breaking can really come into play, right? So frequency, f faster frequency causes them to heat up more. Metals and ceramics also heat up, but it's not a big, it's not nearly as big of an influence because they melt at such higher temperatures, okay? All right, so at the beginning of this chapter, we said that fatigue is a form of failure and it has two parts, crack initiation, crack propagation. Therefore, the total number of cycles until it fails, NF, that's going to be a function of initiation and propagation, NI and NP. Okay. Um, cracks initially propagate slowly on what's called a slip system, which we haven't described yet, but we'll come back to it in chapter eight, right? Um, and then a crack growth rate in stage two, the crack growth typically accelerates, right? The crack growth rate uh, grows by repeating the blunting and sharpening of the crack tip due to tensile and compressive loads. So for example, if this is your crack initially, you apply a load onto it that's tensile, so you're stretching these things out, and then here, it's, it's at the maximum of the tension cycle, and then you start to compress it, it's going to start to squeeze down, and there you are. You've advanced one little bump forward, right? In that tension and compression cycle, you went from there to there, and then you repeat, and you keep on going over. So if you were to look at a material that's undergone fatigue cracking, you'll see a bunch of these little lines. They call them benchmarks, striations, clamshell patterns, right? This is where your crack started, right? You grew a bunch of these little clamshell marks like that, and then when you got to that point, all of a sudden this distance here, that must have been your critical flaw size. And at that point, that was a big enough flaw size for this material that it fractured all the rest of the way through, okay? So 
Crack propagation rate, if you can actually calculate the rate at which your crack is growing, that becomes a really useful metric because you can predict how many cycles something will survive until it fails. Right? So in high cycle fatigue, so samples that break due to fatigue but do so after you know tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of cycles, this is really valuable because we can monitor and predict how things are going to fail. So in order to figure out the crack propagation rate, we need to look at how cracks grow under different conditions, right? So here we show a plot. This is our crack length, and we're plotting it as a function of how many cycles it's been undergoing of fatigue cycling, right? Some cyclic stress. And we learn a couple things. That in some cases, the crack can grow to a certain point, say to 0.8, under three different times, right? This one it can take around 200,000 cycles. This one it takes over 300,000. And this one it takes 500,000. So what's the difference? What's the difference between the three samples? Well, um, it increases with stress and it increases with temperature typically, right? So uh, these might be three different stresses. This might be stress one, stress two, stress three, and we know that stress one must be larger than two, which must be larger than three, because if they, uh, you know, for the same number of cycles, the largest stress is producing the biggest crack length, right? It's growing the most on the crack there, okay? Now, the crack growth equation, this is one of the most famous material science equations. It's called Paris Law. Um, it's one of these classic equations. For some reason, they took it out of our version of the book, the third edition, which boggles my brain. So there is an additional reading that's been put on Canvas, but I'm going to go through it here, and you should be able to use this just as fine as well. The crack growth equation is given here. dA dN is equal to A delta K raised to the N exponent. Now, first things first, this big A and that little n, those are not interatomic force constants. Interatomic force constants, right? So the a, b, n, m, this is not the same thing. Sorry, material science is the study of everything. We run out of variables to name things, right? So this is a different a and n. Um, okay, so don't worry, don't sweat about that. A is your crack size n is the number of cycles. So this is the derivative of your crack length with respect to the number of cycles. So what that's saying is like that's the rate of crack growth, right? You you were here before, one cycle later you got a little bit bigger. So what's that change in length for one cycle? That's dA dn. A is a constant and so is n. These are material constants. n is typically something between 1 and 6, right? And then what is delta k? Delta K is the range in the stress intensity. I'll remind you that stress intensity, that's equal to the maximum stress in the vicinity of some flaw divided by what you thought the applied stress was. So delta K is just what that range is, right? If you're cycling your stress, it's gonna, it's gonna range back and forth, right? So delta K is just whatever your maximum minus your minimum. Or in other words, that's just equal to, because, remember, K is equal to Y sigma pi A you can say that the distance, the difference in k is just equal to this. That expression is the same. The only thing that's that's varying is the the range in your stress, your maximum stress minus your minimum stress. Okay, that's delta k. Um, all right. Now we're going to remember that for this class, we're going to assume that cracks do not grow under a compressive stress. That's not actually true, but for this class, we're going to make that assumption because it's make. It's, a, it's an easier way to treat these things, and for a later class you can deal with the, the real world scenario that they do grow a little bit. Okay, So under compressive stress, we assume that there is no stress intensity factor. It's just zero, right? So the crack will only grow if your stress is greater than zero. Okay, So let's look at this. What we see is the following. When you start to do fatigue testing, your fatigue crack propagation rate, dA or dN, right? that's what's on the y-axis, when you plot that versus your stress intensity factor range, delta K, remember that we had dA over dN equals A delta K raised to the N. So right away you notice that there's this region two where when you plot this on a log axis and a log axis, this region two is linear. So dA dN is linear. Well, this does not look like a linear equation to me, right? dA dN does not look linear there, but it's because they've plotted it on log axes. Again, log axes means 10 to the minus fifth, or that must be 10 to the minus sixth, 10 to the minus five, 10 to the minus four, right? 
This is not scaled linearly, it's scaled logarithmically. 10 to the 0, 10 to the 1, 10 to the 2, right? If this is 10 to the 1, that's 10 raised to the 1 power, right? This is 10 raised to the 2 and so forth, okay? So in order to make this linear, they had to modify this expression. So let's take the natural log of both sides of this. If we take the natural log of dA dn on the left-hand side, then that allows us to take the natural log of a over here plus there's a property of exponents so when you take the natural log of it n comes down in front times mul multiplied by the natural log of delta k right so all of a sudden this can be made to look linear if we say that okay that right there that's y equals m x plus b so that is b n is now m, right, in the mx plus b, and natural log of x, this whole thing, natural log of delta k, that is x, right? So what's plotted on the x-axis? Delta k. And it's shown in a, a, a logarithmic scale, so that's natural log, right, or log, log delta k, okay? So that's how they were able to get this thing to look linear. We're going to come back to that in a moment, okay? Um, so we've already worked through that math here. Now, here's what's really cool. Um, if it's linear in this region, then we can actually start to predict over it, right? From this region, since the crack's going to grow in a predictable way over that region, we can predict how big the crack's going to get, and therefore we can calculate how many cycles until it fails, which is really pretty cool. So let's do so. Um, we started out with DADN, right? We said that we had DADN equals A delta K raised to the N. So the first thing that we're going to do, since we have derivative, derivative, right? We have a changing crack length and the changing number of cycles, is we're going to do something called separating the variables. If you remember this from calculus, it's a trick where we take these and we put them on different sides of the equation, right? We put dn over here all by itself, and we bring dA over here. What this allows us to do is now we can integrate both sides with respect to their you know, respective variables. We're going we're gonna to integrate the left-hand side with respect to the number of cycles, or in other words, from the zero cycle all the way up to the cycle when it fails, nf. We're going to integrate dn, and that's an easy integral. That's just dx. What's the integral of dx? It's x. So you're going to plug in nf minus zero. This is just going to equal nf. On this hand side, we're going to integrate from the smallest crack size, right, over here. That is our initial crack size. And then we're going to stop integrating when we reach the critical crack size. Okay? And we're going to integrate over this, dA, A delta K raised to the N. Now you remember from calculus that anything that doesn't depend on the integral that you're, the variable, and any, in, any variable, let's see, any term that doesn't have the, the variable that you're integrating over can come out of the integral, right? So a and delta k can come out, right? Delta k, we, knew, we said that we can rewrite it as this. Delta k is just equal to y delta sigma times pi, square root of pi a. So everything came out. Here's your pi to the n over half. Like, here's a, there's a sigma. But a had to stay inside, right? So, and y technically, if we go back to what we learned last class, Let's see, where is it? Technically, here's y. Y is this geometric parameter. It's technically a function of a because it's a over w. So technically, a should stay in the integral because it might be the case that as your crack grows up here, a over w gets large, that y is depending on a. And so you technically should have to leave it in the integral and account for how it changes with a. If in the problem I say don't worry about it, that means that even after it grows, it still stays small compared to um, a over w is still a small value, but technically it should stay in the integral, okay? So this is something we can do. We can work with this equation. Um, remember for this equation there's a couple of things. Stress should be in the units of megapascals and crack length should be in units of meters, okay? So make sure you put those in the correct units for this to work out. Um, it all depends on the, the, the units that A and N are given in. I guess A is the one that has units. Um, but for this class, we're going to make sure that you use 
stress in megapascals and your crack length will be in meters, okay? And so here's some typical values for these crack growth rates, right, for different materials, okay? All right, we're gonna do our clicker activity now. You're gonna work through this one. Here's the question. It says, a steel plate with a fracture toughness of 80 megapascals gets alternately loaded in tension up to 500 megapascals and in compression down to 60 megapascals. If the A and N are given, those are your crack growth constants, what is the largest tolerable surface flaw if the component must size must survive for 10 years being cycled once every five minutes, okay? So think about this for a minute. I'm asking you, what's the largest tolerable surface flaw, right? So surface flaw, that means that X equals A, right? The size of the flaw is the half crack length, and this is your initial flaw size. because that initial flaw size is going to grow to a critical flaw size and that's when it's going to fail. And you want it to grow for 10 years being cycled once every five minutes in order for this to work. So go ahead and pause this and give it a shot and then we'll work it out together. Okay, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna figure out how many cycles are there in 10 years. How many, how many cycles are we talking about here? So 10 years, I'm just going to do our old chemistry trick where you convert things. 10 years. In one year, there's 365 days. One day is 24 hours. Uh, one hour is 60 minutes. And there's a cycle uh, once every five minutes. So there's one cycle once every five minutes. When I plug all that in, I find that we've got 1.05 times 10 to the 6 cycles. Okay? So it needs to survive 1 million cycles, right? 1 million 50,000 cycles is what it needs to survive. So that's going to be what we plug in for NF. Okay? So we've got NF. In the problem, we're told what A and N are. Pi is a constant. What about del uh, delta sigma, right? Delta sigma. What's that going to be equal to? Well, it's ranging from 500 megapascals tension all the way down to negative 60 megapascals compression. So it might be tempting to say that the range is 560, but remember that's a mistake because in this class we're assuming a very simplified scenario where cracks only grow under tension, not under compression. So delta sigma is just going to be 500 megapascals, right? Okay. So if we look back at our equation here, we know what NF is. We have A, pi, N, delta sigma, N. This is looking pretty good. We're asked to solve for how big our initial surface flaw can be. We know what Y is. It's just going to be 1.12. So you, you can bring it out of the integral if you want. Um, a is what we're integrating over. So we have everything except for we have AC and A0. We don't know what those are. We're going to solve for A0, but to do so, we need to know what AC is, right? So how do we figure that out? Hopefully you figured this out, that AC is your critical crack length, and we're given the fracture toughness in the problem. We're told that it's 80 megapascal root meters. So we can use our old friend, the Griffith fracture equation, and we can say that K1C that equals 80 megapascals root meters. That's equal to Y times the maximum stress, right, at which this thing's gonna fail at, multiplied by pi, and that is AC, right? So we're gonna plug in 500 megapascals right there, because it's not gonna fail, if it's alternating between 500 megapascals and negative 60, it's not gonna fail anywhere except at the top of the cycle, right? That's when it's going to break, is when it's at its maximum. After a million cycles, it's going to break at the top. Okay, So that allows us to solve for AC. When I do so, I find for AC that our critical flaw size, critical half crack length, I should say, is equal to 0 0.00649 meters. And since this is a surface flaw, the half crack length is equal to the surface flaw length. right? So that's how big AC can be. Now when we look at this, we know everything except for A0. We can go ahead and solve for A0. I'm going to simplify it first before we do that. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to say 
1.05 times 10 to the 6 cycles that's equal to um, I'm going to take everything that was in front of my integral and just replace it with one number. I'm going to plug all the values in. I get 228.2. Then I'm going to take the integral of this thing. I punched it into my calculator and I get 1.159 divided by a to the 0 0.6. We're going to evaluate that integral between two values. The first one is our critical, crawl, critical flaw length, 0 0.00649. Right? Just plug that right in. And the other value is A0, which we need to solve for. When we go ahead and plug those in, we find that it's equal to 264.66 divided by A0 to the 0 0.6 minus 5,438. And then one more step. One more step here when we solve for A0. I get that it is equal to 9.97 times 10 to the negative 7. Or that's in meters, right? If we want to turn that into a number that is microns, then we would say that this is equal to 0 0.997 micrometers. right? That's how big our initial flaw can be if we want this thing to survive for a million cycles, because it's going to slowly grow over time. And after a million cycles, it's now going to be 6.49 millimeters big. It started out a thousand times smaller than that essentially. It's going to grow a thousand times in length and now that's the critical flaw size this thing's going to break. Okay, This is pretty cool stuff. It's not easy. It's not, it's not like super hard though. This is very doable. There's a very easy equation to use. You just have to work through this. Um, really, really valuable stuff because now all of a sudden if you have a flaw that's in a material, let's say you built a great big jumbo jet and replacing the fuselage is expensive all you have to do is be able to monitor the flaw size, right? You can say, um, I know how it's supposed to grow in aluminum, meaning this thing should last another, you know, 500 flights. But in the meantime, we can monitor it with some sort of non-destructive testing, ultrasound or micro CT. We can monitor that crack size and make sure it's not growing fast or doing something funny. And you can actually operate that thing, right? All right. And there's some more example problems of this on YouTube where I work through all the gory details of the math if you want to see it done. All right. Um, I hope that the TAs, if they need, they'll pause temporarily here and they'll talk about how to read information off of log log plots. Right? This goes from, for example, 10, 100, 1000. How's it doing that? What do these different lines represent? So go ahead and pause it and go through that as a quick reminder, TAs. Okay. All right, what factors affect fatigue life? Obviously, um, a higher stress will reduce your fatigue life. We already showed that because a higher stress means it's gonna, the crack's going to grow faster. But surface effects, sharp corners, um, surface treatments, they can make it worse. Like, for example, if you polish something, you normally think like if you polish it, you make it better. But think what sometimes what we might be doing. Polishing it is just putting cracks on the surface, right? And you can actually put pretty big cracks which are on the surface. Remember, those are the worst ones because on the surface, the flaw size is the half crack length. The half crack length in size is half of the flaw size, right? So um, polishing with a really rough grit, like really rough sandpaper, can make things worse. But polishing it to a nice smooth finish can make things better. Um, you can also put the surface under compression. Remember, we said that cracks on the surface are often the really bad ones. And we said that cracks only grow when they're exposed to tension. So you can do something called shot peening or case hardening, which we'll talk about in a few chapters where you basically shot peening, you literally take BBs and you just blast your sample with little tiny BBs. And what it does, it dents the surface. And as it dents it, it puts that area under compression. It puts the entire surface under compression so that a crack in order to grow under tension has to first overcome compression, which is a pretty cool, that's, that's pretty cool that somebody came up with that, All right? All right, there's other factors we need to care about. One of them is envi environmental factors associated with fracture like thermal fatigue. A thermal stress that can give rise has to do with the difference in thermal expansion between something, the modulus of that material, and then the difference in temperature that it's going to fluctuate. This is a big deal. If you've ever driven over a freeway and you've seen one of these things on the ground, this is an expansion joint, right? Those big bridges are made of uh, largely ceramic materials, asphalt, right? This is a composite, but it's a it can be a brittle material. And uh, if you had that thing alternating temperature, day to night, summer to winter, that whole bridge is going to have to expand and contract. And if it's trying to expand, 
and it's all bonded together, that's going to be a problem. So they actually build in joints like that that allow it to expand and contract without fracturing. That's pretty amazing, right? So that, that's thermal stresses. All right, creep. Creep is temperature, a time-dependent permanent plastic deformation that occurs under a constant load. So when you put these books on this bookshelf, right, and this Godzilla figurine here, uh, on day one, that wasn't enough to make this shelf bend. And the load didn't change. You put the same number of books on here and you didn't do anything to it, but you let it sit for like five years. And over time, you found, hey, it was actually creeping down lower and lower really slowly, right? You can see this all over the place. You can see it on roofs. You can see it all over the place, and it's a big problem. Um, on day one, there might be some initial strain, right? The day that you apply the load, there's some initial strain. That's your initial strain. But over time, you'll find that there's three regions. If you plot it, there's this initial region where it starts to strain. There's this really nice, typically flat, linear secondary region. And then right before it breaks, there's this tertiary region where the strain picks up again. What's great about this secondary region, secondary or steady state creep, is that it's linear, right? Meaning it's predictable, meaning that we can plan around it. We can engineer around that. And that's what we're going to do in this, in this section, right? So... Um, the, the strain rate, that curve, it's going to depend on temperature and stress, right? If you make something high temperature or you really apply a big stress, then you'll still have a, a linear region, but the overall strain that you're going to accumulate is just much faster. If you have lower stress and lower temperature, you have this linear region, but it's at a lower rate. So the rate depends on the, the environmental conditions around it, okay? Um, what we'd like is we'd like to be able to monitor this, right? How to model this. How do we model it? We do it with this equation. We want to develop an expression that shows what the creep uh, strain rate, the steady state creep strain rate is. So the little strain symbol here with the dot above it, that means the strain rate, right? That's d epsilon dt is what that's telling you, the rate at which the strain is changing, right? And that's equal to this expression, k, a constant, times sigma, the stress, raised to n, another constant, multiplied by the exponential of negative q, divided by RT. Q is what we call an activation energy, and we're going to talk about activation energies a ton this semester. Um, this is what's known as a thermally activated process, meaning if you heat up temperature, then this term, since it's negative Q over RT and you make Q lar T large, this term is going to blow up. You're going to get really fast creep if you go to high temperatures, because it's a thermally activated process. Um, lots and lots of things in this class are thermally activated, so we will come back to this. Um, okay, so another way of doing this, just like we did before, is we can plot this in a way that makes it linear. Like this is not a linear equation, but just like before, let's take the natural log of both sides. Now we're going to have natural log of our strain rate, right? This is going to be equal to the natural log of k plus n times the natural log of sigma plus, this is going to be, I guess, or minus q over rt. Right? The Q the natural log of the exponential made it just disappear, right? So all of a sudden this becomes Y, this whole thing becomes B plus they're they're plotting against one over T, so it's minus Q over R um, multiplied by one over T. This is let's see, this is X and that's M. Let me move this down. So there's y equals mx plus b. You can make that look linear by breaking this up. Or in other words, if you could plot the natural log of the strain rate, and you plot it against 1 over t, the temperature, and you take this slope of these different things, that's all just the activation energy for creep, negative q over r. It's the activation energy for creep divided by the gas constant, r. This is pretty cool, right? And that's going to be the same constant. Uh, that slope shouldn't be changing for different stresses. Stress just moves this thing up and down. Different stresses, high versus low stress, move that up and down. So you'll have an example to do that on this next homework. Um, and it's tricky, so I suggest watching this YouTube uh, solution tutorial where I walk through this in all its gory details on how to do these calculations. Okay. Um, now, different n values can indicate that there's different mechanisms of creep, right? Creep can Creep is literally atoms moving, right? It's, it's plastic deformation. That means that the atoms are, are moving in some way. 
there's different ways they can move. They can move along um, grain boundaries, GB. They can move along what are called vacancies, dislocations. We haven't talked about these yet, but we will later. Just realize that for now, there's different ways that atoms can flow through a material, and we'll come back to that, okay? All right, so some of these experiments, right? This bookshelf, when they designed this bookshelf, the engineer that made it, they probably made it, and on day one, they're like, sweet, works awesome. And then five years later, they got all these people who bought it on day one that are now mad, and they're emailing them saying, my bookshelf sucks, right? fix it. And they could have avoided this problem if they did some sort of accelerated testing to figure out how it's going to deform over time, right? So accelerated testing. How do you do accelerated testing? You heat it up, right? You heat it up or you increase the stress, right? So these are known as stress rupture tests, right? You can heat it up or you can increase the stress in order for these to, to work better, right? Um, the typical way they do it is with something called a Larson-Miller parameter, right? So shown here, this is the stress at which something fails. X-axis is the Larson-Miller parameter, which I'll show you in a minute. And then this is where the different materials lie. The Larson-Miller parameter, it allows you to estimate the lifetime of a given component for a particular combination of stress and temperature, right? So this is really cool. You can say, I need something to survive at a certain temperature for a certain number of hours, what's the maximum stress that I can take it up to? That's what the Larson-Miller parameter lets you do. So it has goofy units. First thing to realize is that the temperature is in Kelvin and the time T is almost always in hours. Unless it says otherwise, that's the assumption, right? So Larson-Miller parameter has this expression. You take the temperature that you want to test it at, divide it by 1,000. You multiply that by the quantity of a plus B, these are going to be constants that depend on whatever's given for the plot, times the natural log of hours, right? So a typical plot might look something like this, right? Here they show you the stress at which something will fail at. The x-axis is your Larson-Miller parameter. They show you what the two constants are. It's 36 and 0.78. Um, since they haven't said otherwise, this T is in hours and temperature is in Kelvin, okay? So let's go ahead and do this clicker example. I'll get it set up for you. Say, what is the maximum stress in PSI, PSI because these people are barbarians and they don't use megapascals, right? But for an iron chain that has to be used in a furnace for five years at 600 Celsius. So go ahead and set that one up. Remember, what you're going to do is uh, convert temperature to Kelvin, time to hours, and you're going to plug in for your Larson Miller parameter and see what strength that corresponds to. So go ahead and give that a shot. Okay, the first thing we should do is turn the time into hours, right? So five years, we're going to do our same trick from before. In one year, 365 days. Uh, in one day, 24 hours. So we can turn that into hours. When I do so, I find that we have to survive 43,000 hours, 43,800 hours, right? That's our time in hours. Next step, 600 Celsius. 600 Celsius plus 273 turns it into Kelvin. This is 873 Kelvin. So let's give ourselves a touch more room. Our Larson-Miller parameter is going to be equal to 873 divided by 1,000 K, right? Multiplied by, in this case, it's 36 plus 0 0.78, because that's what's given in the figure, right? multiplied by the natural log of 43,800. When I plug all that in, I find that our Larson-Miller parameter is equal to 38.7. So now all we need to do is find out where that is, right? There's 38.40, so that's 39. That's about where we're at. So I see that it intersects right there. Bring this over. If that's 1,500, around 1,750, maybe 1,800, looks like it would survive about 1800 PSI. And again, there's more examples of that on YouTube. And that is our entire chapter of failure, how things fracture and fail in material science. So our next chapter is going to be crystal structure. Um, I think we'll stop this one for right now. See you next time.